A number of years ago, I sat in on a reading by the poet Gregory Orr. Gregory Orr was then and is now a favorite poet of mine. In fact, he's a favorite writer of mine. And he was maybe five or six pieces into this reading when a conversation struck up between two of the other gentlemen in the room. Sitting behind me, I heard one of them say loudly enough for me to hear, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> and I've definitely heard that about poetry or about poems or a poem before. I've probably even said that, even as an English major and someone who writes poetry. I don't get it. So that's not the remarkable part of the story, to say or to hear, I don't understand this poem or poetry. What was notable was that the person he was talking to gave that moment a pause and said, actually, not everything is meant to be understood. This need or desire in me to understand is, in essence, an expression of control. When I talk about getting something, I want to talk about understanding something. Part of what I mean by that is that I have a kind of power over it. Part of what good, if not great, poetry does is that it disorients me to my own language. It disorients me to the words I normally would use to, in fact, identify, name, pin down, and control the world around me. Great poetry gives me the opportunity to get altitude over my own life, to reorient myself and my perspective to be, in fact, charmed again by the life I'm actually living. And while you won't find in me an enemy of literalism on the whole, what you will hear me say is that a strictly literalist understanding of life, scripture, relationship, and humanity steals from me the sacred joy and gift of being named in my life. You see, when I name myself or I name my world, I generally do so unfortunately, by the posture of power and control and in usefulness, when all the while near the heart of my being is the desire to be more than useful, to be more than understanding and more than powerful, to in fact be loved. And to be beloved is a thing that can only be named from outside myself. And deeper than that, to receive that title from someone else, from a culture, or from God, requires me to be in a position of powerlessness, requires me to be in a position in which I don't get to understand, I simply get to receive. Poetry primes the spirit, primes the mind, loosens the grips I have on the language by which I would control my life, my definitions, and postures me to actually become someone who can be loved. And is that not the thing in life that simply is wider, deeper, stronger, and better than any form of understanding is love. One of the great tragedies of religious culture and religious practice is the propensity to lean towards literalism, not because literalism is an enemy in and of itself. It's simply a limited way to understand the language by which we talk about humanity and the divine and history and relationship. Some things, yes, should be understood, but only in the service of posturing me to love my world better. The need I have, the desire I have to understand the world around me should always be subservient to the call and the deeper desire to love my world. To understand you should not be my goal. To love you well should. And yes, sometimes if I don't understand you, and I don't understand why you are the way you are, it can be more difficult to love you. On the other hand, sometimes the desire to just get you is too small a goal. And I don't get the great joy of discovering and learning and having to expand in order to receive you as you are. And that is the call of great poetry, to pause long enough to listen to the pattern, to the rhythm, to the placement and the choice of the words put on the page or uttered by the author's mouth. That I would open myself up slightly wider to a different understanding of the same word that I might receive that word, might receive that reality at a deeper level in a different way. 
And if I can do that with language, then maybe I can do that with the people around me. Culture is usually formed and shaped and solidified by the words we use to identify the lines between people. I'm here, you're there, and this is our relationship. Poetry takes those words, sometimes unpacks them and sometimes unpacks us with them, that we might look around our lives and inside ourselves and say something more like this. I don't understand. And that's probably not just okay. That's probably good. Because I'm not here to get it. I'm here to love well. In the park near my house is a series of trails that intersect a small creek in a few spots, and in the winter, that creek rises, and it's almost impossible to cross at one location. So, a few years ago, someone built a bridge over that spot. They saw a problem, and they created a solution in order to address it. Then, a week or so later, someone else tore it down. And then, in response, the original builder took some of the broken pieces from the first bridge and use them to assemble a new bridge. And I think that's actually how life works and moves forward. Which is why I wrote that story into my next book entitled, It Is What You Make Of It. 15 stories that push back against the kind of it is what it is thinking that keeps us from entering into the world around us and living fully. The book comes out on June 1st. You can pre-order it now. I hope you do. 